Hey everybody, welcome to Sewing in Slippers with Sue. I'm Sue Pelland and today we have a special guest with me, uh, Sandy. Sandy is from the Quilters by the Sea Quilt Guild in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. In fact, Sandy is the president of that quilt guild. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you very much for having me. It's a I'm pleasure. So so glad to have you here. Now, if you are out there uh, listening, um, I'm having a little trouble with my microphone, uh, excuse me, my headphones. So I've got a little bit of background noise that's uh, giving me a little trouble hearing Sandy. So I want you to comment in the comments if you are hearing me okay, or if you're getting that feedback that I'm getting. All right, Sandy, let's take this away. I am so curious. Um, how you got started quilting and where that journey has um, brought you, where you've gone in your quilting journey. Um, I became interested in quilting when I was a teenager. And I can tie it to one specific event. So wow. in the run up to the American Bicentennial, there was this great revival in interest in American handicrafts. And in around 1972, I believe it was McCall's published their very first quilting magazine. And it featured uh, historical antique quilts, as well as some new modern designs. I purchased that magazine and I was so smitten by these quilts. I thought they were beautiful. Now I had been sewing for quite a few years. My mother taught me how to use her sewing machine when I was nine years old. And I had been making a lot of my clothing, but I had never done quilts. And I really didn't know much about quilts. Um, none of my near relatives quilted. Now, my mother did sew. She was a great garment sewer. She taught me to sew. And I, but I, but there was no one who was quilting. The funny thing, we had a summer cottage at the time, and there was an old quilt at the summer cottage that I believe my great grandmother had made. Oh, so but it is in your history back there it's somewhere. Back there somewhere. And I'm really proud of myself in that I took the time one day to lay this quilt out and measure it because it was before we had these fancy you know uh, cell phones that can take pictures i drew a diagram I, and i wrote in all the measurements this is this far this like this size oh because, interesting because a year or two later my aunt washed the quilt and it started to fall apart and she just threw it out <gasps> oh no have I you know. recreated that quilt yet sandy or I is that on your to-do list it's on my to-do list so I keep thinking every once in a while it pops into my head, I need to do this. So I made my first quilt in the summer of 1975. I had just graduated from high school. And it was a simple Amish design with stripes that came out of one of those, that magazine. Okay, and right the, from that original inspiration. And the following year, I pieced a quilt to give to my cousin for his wedding. And then I stopped because I was just too busy. I went to college, I went to grad school, I started working, I got married, I had my daughter. I just stepped away from it. I still did garment sewing, but I didn't do much quilting. And I didn't come back to quilting until around 1995, 1997, somewhere around there. And I was reading, I, I live near Rhode Island in, in southeastern Massachusetts. I was reading the Providence Journal and I saw an advertisement that said, are you going to be a football widow this Super Bowl Sunday? Why don't you come spend the day with us quilting? And it was from a quilt shop in the area. And I was, oh my God, there's a quilt shop. I can go buy fabric. I was so excited. So I sought, I sought out this shop and I ended up taking classes there. And that's okay. how I ended up on my quilting journey. That what was started. the name of that shop, Sandy? I want to say Just Quilt. In Bristol. in Bristol. Okay, yes. I remember it well. Remember the shop? Yes. Yes. So right. Sandy and I grew up in the same area. Sandy, are you from Swansea, Mass? I am originally from New Jersey. Oh, you're originally from New I'm Jersey? Not oh, okay. I'm from this area. We okay. Came, yeah, we came to this area because my husband had a job in this area. I see. I see. So your guild is in the area that I grew up. Right. So that's probably a more accurate statement right there. Correct. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is the guild that uh, my mom and I belonged to when we had a shop in Rhode Island. So we had a small shop in Tiverton, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and we belonged to the Quilters by the Sea. That was when I was in mm -hmm. high school. So we have a little bit of a parallel uh, <laughs> life there. And all bit. through high school, I did garment sewing as well. But you know what, Sandy, unlike you, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like the fitting. I didn't like to make a pattern that I didn't know was going to be was going to look good on my body type. So, you know, not being able to try on patterns, having to make a, uh, a muslin sample, um, all of that just seemed like a lot of work to me when I was um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when I was. Uh, in high school, I started buying all my own clothing, and I really wanted to put my time into quilting. So I started quilting when I was about 13 years old. Wow. So yeah, similar, but similar time period. Mm -hmm. We both started quilting around the bicentennial. Very cool. So Sandy, you started back into quilting in the 90s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And where did that journey take you? Starting in the 90s, what was your focus? I know your original love was those traditional quilts that you saw in the magazine. I still made a lot of traditional quilts. Um, I have a real soft spot for dress and plates. Um, I made some Irish, Irish chain quilts. And I started subscribing to the quilting magazine. So any pattern that I saw in a magazine that struck my fancy, I would... Now, I have to admit, I don't always follow a pattern. I'm much more <laughs> likely to look at the pattern and say, that's nice, but I want to do it this way. In fact, yeah. I've developed a bad habit of when I flip through them, I have a pen in my hand, and I, I start, like, changing the blocks right in the magazine. Oh, that's not a bad habit at all. That's so wonderful. I, Making so I them look, your own. Yes, I look at the block, and I think, oh, that block I think would look better if it had half square triangles here and here, and I'll just draw them in. Yeah, so and you're very... I, you're very creative and innovative then. I have made very few quilts from a pattern that I followed, very few. Okay, there's another similarity between us, Sandy. <laughs> I do the same thing. There's always an easier way or a more fun way or a better way right. or a more creative way to do exactly. that pattern. And it's wonderful to use patterns for inspiration, but I love to take it in my own direction. So that's really cool. I love that you are a similar free spirit. I am. <laughs> now, recently I've become much more interested in doing quilts that feature red work embroidery. And it doesn't uh, necessarily have to be red, but I love the detail in the images. And okay. that started in, um, I think it was 2015 when we did the row by row experience. I remember that program that encouraged people to visit quilt shops across the country. And each shop offered a four block row that you could assemble into a quilt. And yep. that year, the theme was water. So I visited, I stopped at the shop in Barrington that was called Knit One Quilt Two. It recently changed hands and has a new name now. Oh, and I didn't realize it had a new name. Okay, yes. cool. Um, it's called Stitch Supply now. Oh, okay. And, um, they offered a block that was four images of sea creatures, a seahorse, I don't know what name of it, a shrimp, something like that. And the block had, the row had been designed by Allison Wilbur, and she um, had the, the um, pictures done in stitching, but it was ja Japanese sashiko. So it was white thread on a beautiful blue fabric. And um, I did not know how to do sashiko at the time. I was unfamiliar with that. But I remembered that I had learned embroidery when I was a, a, in middle school, probably. And I knew how to do stem stitch or outline stitch. Mm -hmm. So I decided to stitch those blocks like that. They oh, okay. So nice. They were so pretty. I could not bring myself to put them into the row in the quilt. So instead, I made a wall hanging. And I thought, this was a lot of fun. I should do more embroidery. I haven't done a lot of this recently. Well, at this time, my husband and I uh, had a home in Florida. And when we would drive to Florida, my husband liked to do the majority of the driving. I, thankfully, I don't get car sick. And sitting in the car like that is boring. Yes. I thought, if I could do handwork in the car, I could accomplish something and not be bored. Absolutely. I've always had a passion for antique uh, 
picture postcards, the Victorian era Christmas postcards. Oh, beautiful. I looked online and I discovered you could find quite a few of them on the internet. And they're so old that they are now in the public domain. Ah. Which meant that I could use these images and not have to worry about copyright infringement. Right. So I found a picture of a Santa Claus that I thought was really lovely, drew it on a piece of white fabric, and that's how I kept myself busy on the car ride to Florida. Oh, okay. And then okay. when I drove home at the end of the holiday, I did another one. I figured I really needed four to make a quilt, and those four stances ended up being my first quilt of my own design that featured red work embroidery. Okay. Wonderful. So red work's a real passion for you. It's a real passion. And I tend, because my background, my, my um, original um, occupation was I was a research scientist. Oh. I like um, detail. I like things to be accurate. And this is one reason why I am really drawn to the Victorian era drawings, because they are full of amazing detail. Now, the trick is getting it into a red work design that isn't so busy, you lose what it's trying to show you. But I like it to have enough detail so that it's authentic. Wonderful. So you started doing red work. Is, did, did most of your quilts end up going in that direction? Or were you still doing a variety of different techniques? I still do a variety of different You still techniques. do even now. In yes. fact, right, I, I, I'm sort of, sort of like a, a split personality. I really enjoy very modern quilts. I like working with solid color fabrics, but I also love the very fine detail work in red work embroidery from the Victorian era images. Ah, excellent, excellent. Well, Sandy, we got reunited when I went to uh, the quilt show last weekend, or was it two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, I think. Two weeks ago in, um, in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And I was so lucky as a vendor at the show, and I was not able to vend at the show, but I was able to attend. But as a uh, prospective vendor for the show, I was allowed to give a ribbon to one special quilt in the show. And as I walked through that show, I found this amazing quilt. So bear with me here. I'm going to uh, share my screen with everybody so that hopefully I'll be able to show them that very special quilt. Before I do, let's see if I can, um, I'm trying to adjust the size and I'm not having much luck with that. So let me just go ahead and share a picture of that quilt. So this is the amazing red work. I'm, I say red work in uh, quotes. <laughs> exactly. Because because it is blue work and it is white work, but it's the same technique that is typically called red work. In addition to the amazing embroidery on this quilt, Sandy took some of the motifs and she quilted those very daringly with dark blue thread on that white background. And Sandy, I would love for you to walk us through this quilt. But before you do, I want to point out that there's another blue quilt behind this one hanging in the show. So those white edges that you see with that beautiful curve, um, I don't know how big your blocks are, but that looks like the eight inch curve to me from my Leaves Galore tool. Sandy made this beautiful um, binding or a finish on her quilt. It's not a binding, it's not a facing. It's a beautiful finish on her quilt that um, mimics the curves um, or the, the faux curves that are in that pattern. Now, when you have a piece pattern like this and it kind of brings your eye around, kind of gives you the illusion of curves, but they're not true curves. Those are all straight lines in the quilt. But Sandy decided to put this beautiful curved um, finish on her quilt. So Sandy, walk us through this quilt. I just love it. Well, I wanted to do my own version of the row by row block that I had, wall hanging I had done. And so I went looking for um, images of sea creatures that were full of detail. Now I knew that there was a, a German naturalist named Ernst Haeckel 
He lived from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. He was a German naturalist, and he's the man who coined the word ecology. And oh. he spent quite a bit of time in the Pacific, um, South, the South, Southern Pacific area, collecting specimens. These were the people who went out and collected examples of all these new creatures that we were discovering in the far flung reaches of the globe at that er, er, in that era. And he made detailed drawings and paintings of them and sold them in books as a subscription to support his work. Oh. So you can find these images online. So a lot of these images come from his publications. And I um, would print out the image, um, put it on a white box, trace a line drawing of it, trying to distill the image into a simple line drawing. And then I did the, the embroidery on it. So the nine blocks in the center are all hand embroidered. And they then, are stunning. Thank you. And um, I did um, meandering quilting around them to try and just flatten the back so that those images would stand out. Yeah, lots of I, echo quilting first and then meandering mm -hmm. around. And Very nice. I just thought they deserved a storm at sea fashion. So those are those blocks. And when I finally put the outside row on, I had all this white area and I couldn't decide what to do there. Now I have always been a fan of Beth Ann Nemish's work and she makes quilts that have these beautiful seams and they're all stitched into the, the um, fabric. So can I do this? Is it possible? So I decided to take a stab at it. And I did some practice ones where I, Try different colors of thread to see if I could actually pull it off. Oh, hold on, Sandy. I'm going to stop that share for a minute because I want to share you. Just so give me are, one minute. Oh, beautiful. So I, I wanted to see what thread color would work and could I actually pull this off? Wow. So the, and then I tried, again, a larger one looking to see what would work. That is a little bit. stunning. And then I use a light box and a water soluble pen to draw the images on that outer border of the quilt before I made the quilt sandwich. Now wow. the one problem I had <laughs> was I was working, I think I worked on quilting this for almost eight months. I worked on it for quite a long time. So I over can this imagine. summer, I was working on it. It was very hot and humid and the water soluble pen started to disappear because there was so much humidity in the air. Yes. <laughs> And some of them actually did disappear, which in some ways was good because it allowed me to change them. It was tricky because I already had the, the sandwich together and I had already started quilting a large part of the area, but I did manage to make some adjustments and keep on quilting it. Wow. So, um, there's one thing that I kind of regret, and that is in the uh, Storm at Sea fashion, in the areas that uh, are dark blue, I, yes. I quilted. Can you see this? I'm not sure if you can see this. Yes. I quilted a scallop shell and two little starfish on either side of it. Can you see that? Yes. So that's, that's what I quilted in those corners. But I used um, thread that was so matchy matchy that you can't see it. Yeah, all that work and, you can't, that work and you can't but see it. I can see it right here in the bottom. Let me share again. Um, in the bottom corners, uh, there, or I'm sorry, let me find that window. There we go. Okay. So down here in these corners, I can actually see that shell pattern. Okay. But I know exactly what you mean. You go through all yeah. of that work and the fabric competes with the thread and you're not able to see it as well as you should be able to. Now, Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong. You did this on your domestic sewing machine. Yes. I don't have a long one. Wow. I have a Bernina 790. So I did it on my domestic machine. Fantastic. And now, I can explain how I did the outer border. Yes, please do. So I wanted to um, have a shape out there that would be slightly curved and be reminiscent of a wave. But oh. I also wanted to take the line of the storm at sea pieces and carry that angle right off the edge of the quilt. So that's why I broke it up like that. 
I you love it in those corners, those corners <laughs> with little triangles. You can think of this as um, an oddly shaped prairie point because that's how I approached it. So I cut, I made a pattern and I cut a piece like this and um, it looks very much like a collar on a garment. Yes, it does. So it's two pieces of fabric sewn together and I added a uh, layer of fusible interfacing. So on the layer of fusible interfacing, I trimmed the seam allowance away, applied it, ironed it on to one, one, one side, and then I sewed them together so that when you turn the piece, all of the seam allowances will lie on one side up against the uh, interfacing. And this means when you turn it over and you put the interfacing piece on top, you won't have any shadowing. So you won't see the uh, seam allowances because you don't want that to uh, show through. Because that you is want brilliant. This to be a solid piece. And since wow. there's no batting in there, which could help you know, hide that, I had to do something to cover it. And so that's why I used the interfacing. And then I did um, parallel lines of stitching along this in the same light blue thread as I did before. I put them on the edge of the quilt and I did apply a facing and was about um, two and a half inches wide. I um, ironed the, the outside raw edge under so it would be easy to turn. Stitched them all along the edge of the quilt, turned the facing over to the back and hand stitched the facing in place. Fantastic. Sandy, that is a <laughs> wonderful technique. You could put any shape on the yes. outside of your quilt using this technique. And one of my favorite shapes is just a half circle. And that's a really fun way to edge a quilt as well, or even two rows of half circles so that it creates that overlapping right. look. But this is a stunning quilt. And everybody that has my Leaves Galore templates, you recognize that curve as uh, it looks like an eight inch curve. I think this is larger. Sandy, do you remember your block size on this quilt? Oh, gosh, no. I'm That's sorry. okay. That's okay. I'm guessing it's probably like an eight or nine inch block size, maybe I 10 inches. I think they might be a little bit bigger. I'm pretty sure they're uh, bigger than eight inches. Okay, okay. Well, it is just an absolute stunning quilt. You should be so proud of your work. So sorry. So sorry. Let me get rid of this. Uh, oh, I should have turned off my phone before we got started. All right. So Sandy, congratulations on this amazing work. But this is only one of your spectacular quilts. <laughs> and Sandy, I want to uh, let everybody know that we met um, fairly recently, I would say in the past three or four years at the New England Quilt Museum. We were there for Meet the teachers. So I know that you're out there teaching and I'm curious to know what you teach and what's your range for teaching. If some of these ladies would like to bring you to their guild, um, is that possible? So we have people from Canada. We have people from all over the U.S. Um, on here. So I'd love to know how far away you teach and what do you teach? Um, right now I have a trunk shelf and it features my quilts that have red work embroidery and it's entitled adding red work embroidery to your quilts. And ah. um, if, if you would just let me tell a little story, when I yes. was at the last uh, Meet the Teachers event, um, I uh, took one of my quilts with me. At, for those who aren't familiar with the setup, they put all the teachers in the classroom and our audience are the representatives from the guild. And each teacher has about 10 minutes to talk about what they're offering. And then we do breakout sessions in the galleries where each teacher has a table and guild representatives can come up to the teachers and make arrangements for them. To right. And this the is guild. at the New England Quilt Museum. Yes. So they're right. promoting teachers to the guilds. They have all their member guilds send their, um, their program people to right. this Meet the Teachers event. So this is where Sandy and I met. Mm -hmm. And so go ahead, continue so, with your story. Um, so when I gave my little speech, I held up m one of my quilts and there was an audible gasp in the room. My husband's supposed to take care of that, sorry. And <laughs> No worries. And, and so um, I was very happy about that. But when we went to the breakout sessions, um, the first couple guilds that came up to me said, um, 
I think your work is gorgeous, but there's no one in our guild who does red work, so I don't think you'd be a good match for us. Right. So finally, when another guild came up to me and said the same thing, I, I turned around, because we were right in the gallery, and I was like, look, right behind me, there's this very modern quilt. Would I ever aspire to make a very modern quilt like that? Probably not, but I could still learn quite a bit from looking at this quilt. I can look at the use of color and line and value. I can look at the way the quilt has been quilted, what kind of free motion quilting patterns were used. I can look at any sashings or border treatments. I can look at the way the binding has been applied. So even though it's a very modern quilt and I probably wouldn't make it, I can still learn a lot from it. And so for people who don't do red work embroidery, I still think that there's a lot that they can see and learn from my quilts. Excellent. So I have a, a, a lecture. I talk about the history of red work embroidery because I'm very interested in the history of our craft and art. Mm -hmm. I talk a little bit about my personal journey, and then I show 16 quilts, uh, all, 14 of which are my original designs. Wow, fantastic. And then as a workshop, I have two workshops. I have one where I can teach people how to do red work embroidery. Mm. And so I have several designs that people can choose from. And um, although I would usually um, surround this with a sashing and quilt it, I leave it in the hoop so that students can see the back of the piece. So they know yes. what the back of the stitches are. Excellent. And I have another one, like I said. Now, I recognize there are two things that um, I'm trying to keep in my mind. One is that not everybody does web work embroidery. And two, people enjoy a project that they can finish or get the majority of it done in a workshop. So I have a small wall hanging that I recently designed with the Halloween um, can, can you pull back, Sandy, so we can see the whole thing? Oh, beautiful. Now, like I said, I am, a uh, dress and plate is one of my favorites, but the stitching on this was done by machine. So it wasn't done by hand. It, if someone wanted to do the embroidery stitches by hand, they could. But if you're a person who's never going to take the time to learn that, you could do the stitching on your machine and you'd finish the project much quicker. So oh, I'm trying excellent. to make something that would be uh, available to anybody, whether you do handwork or not. That is wonderful. And I, I think, love that. I think I see the beginning of a block of the month from this. <laughs> yes, I could I think that certainly well. see that. So that's really interesting, Sandy. Another parallel in our lives. <laughs> um I, I love the fact that you're encouraging people that may not do handwork to still explore the technique, but find a way to do it on their machine. And that's exactly what I do with applique, yeah, that's, right? That's absolutely true, absolutely true. Yeah, I encourage yeah. people that, that love the look of applique that are terrified of trying it to go ahead and learn how to do it with their rotary cutter, with their sewing machine. So it takes all of that mm -hmm. hard work out of the technique. So that is just wonderful. I love how you're exposing new quilters to new techniques that they can do that they might have been hesitant to try in the traditional way. So they can experience the joy. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's what it is, it's full of joy. Absolutely. So Sandy, um, bringing joy into my world of quilting is a very important fact for me. I really love to keep my quilting fun, light, and easy. I don't want to stress over projects not being finished, projects half done. Um, how do you handle being a teacher needing to get... Um, work done to show your students, yet still enjoy that process and not put so much pressure on yourself. Do you have any tips for us? Well, I, I try to block out a, a, at least two hours a day that I get to spend sewing. Oh, and I love that. And this is my personal time. So it's usually in the afternoon, like from three to five. It brings me joy and ah, calmness in your busy day. So it, exactly. It, that's to do what you like when you and, and the other thing is when my husband and I watch television in the evening, that's when I do my hand embroidery. Okay, so you wonderful. You just have to block out time for yourself to do. 
doesn't always have to be that much time, but you know, sometimes. It's really yeah. Important. Yeah. I'm striving for 23 minutes a day personally. <laughs> <laughs> I never get it. Uh, well, I should say I, I rarely get an extended stretch like that. But I find that with just a little bit of a dedicated right. time, it's amazing how much forward process at progress you can make on your projects. That's absolutely true. Now, mm. as for where I would travel, I, right now I've been traveling mainly in my local area, but um, I'm more than willing to discuss uh, the possibility of traveling with someone else. Okay. So my friends out there, um, if you are involved in a guild and you would like to uh, see more of Sandy's work, make sure you make the recommendation to your program people, because I think Sandy has so much to offer. And I can already see with the little bit of teaching that you've done right here, what a wonderful teacher and speaker you are. So that's really exciting that you're willing to talk about traveling outside of uh, the Rhode Island and, and Southern Ma Southeastern Massachusetts vicinity. Excellent. I'd also like to mention that if someone in Northern California wants to see my quilt, it will it be in the Pacific International Quilt Festival this coming weekend. Oh, I just love the Pacific International Quilt Festival that's in San, Santa, Santa Clara. Clara. Mm -hmm. Santa Clara, California. I used to vend there, Sandy. Oh, really? So I spent many years there with the Mancuso Management Group, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I love their quilt shows. They That's do a such show. a fabulous job. They that really is do. probably their their number one top notch show. Mm -hmm. It's it's my absolute favorite one that they put on. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank and you that's why you don't have the Sea Life quilt to show us today. Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's already hanging at that show. Congratulations. Are you going you. out to the show to see your quilt? Yes, I'm flying tomorrow morning. So I'll be there on Friday. Oh, fantastic. Now, are you just going for the show or is there more uh, appeal out there for you? <laughs> My daughter lives in San Francisco. She works in the tech industry, so I'll be able to combine a oh. wonderful trip to the show with family time. Oh, that is fabulous. There's nothing like mothers and daughters being yes. together. <laughs> Do you? It's the story of her life. Her whole life I've been dragging her to cold shows. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter as well. <laughs> Uh, just the one daughter, Sandy, or yes, do you have? Just, no, just one daughter. Oh, fantastic. Good. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so excited that you get to go out to California this week and see that fabulous quilt show okay. and for everybody to see your amazing Sea Life quilt. Okay. Now, Sandy, you have a beautiful quilt behind you that looks like a scrap quilt and it yes. looks like a fun one. Mm -hmm. This Tell one, um, so uh, in the early 2000s, I belonged to an internet block exchange. They were very popular at the time. Yes. And um, there was a group of us from all over the country, and we swapped hourglass blocks. Every month, it was a different theme. So this particular one, we swapped uh, polka dot blocks. Okay. I and, like that. And I, I think, actually, I think we did it twice because we swapped blocks for more than three years. We swapped. I, wow. And I, I still have probably 500, if not more, hourglass blocks in the bin waiting to be put into a project. And oh, made, what fun. I have made so many quilts with those hourglass blocks, and I still have a pile of them. But um, this was actually, what for years, I was what's called a topper. So I made the quilt tops, but I didn't quilt them themselves. This was one of the first ones that I actually got quilted. Ah, <laughs> so and it's so one you of did my the quilting. Things. I, I didn't do the quilting. No, I didn't even do oh, you, it. I just finally I, you had, it I, I had it done. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Now, Sandy, of course, I would use my hearts and more tools to make those circles in the squares. And are those appliqued by hand or by machine? No, they're done by machine. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how I would do them. I would either do applique or reverse applique, mm -hmm. depending on the color combination. And we would get those all made in lickety split with the yeah. heart and more tools. So much fun. I love that quilt. Thank so you. Um, I love the idea of a good swap. And I've been toying with the idea of doing a swap in my Ahead of the oh. Curve membership. I think it would be so much fun to have... Um, maybe a leaf block 
that uh, was signed by each of the members in our membership group. We have about 125 members right now. And I think it would really be fun um, to make and swap those blocks. So ladies out there, if you are in our Ahead of the Curve membership group and you have an idea for a swap, I would love to entertain um, putting together a swap for our membership. Yes, they were all the rage back then, weren't they, Sandy? And yes. I missed that. I swapped during the uh, Millennium Quilt ah. craze, and I swapped for four different Millennium Quilts. That did you, means did you 2,000 make fabrics <laughs> times four. Ask, did you do a Y2K? <laughs> oh, my God. I, never, I, didn't, I do have a quilt that has uh, Y2K fabric in it. With yep. fabric that has the year 2000. Yes, I use those for the back of my quilts. Yes, I was too new to quilting, I was intimidated by that whole thought. Okay, well, I made one of the Y2K quilts, but I still have three more that I wow. need to make. <laughs> Need to. need to. I probably will <laughs> never do that. I always thought I needed one for myself and one for each of my kids that were uh, millennials. <laughs> what fun. That's so much fun. So, Sandy, where is your quilting bringing you in the future? Do you see yourself really focusing more on the red work? Or is that a phase of your journey that's past? Or is it something that's always going to keep popping up in your quilts? I think I'm going to move forward with my red work. I enjoy doing it. I have a, I, um, two, two um, embroidery projects that I'm working on right now. One is about 95% finished, and I already have this other one drawn on fabric, and I started doing it. When I finish an embroidery design that I want to showcase in the center of a quilt, it usually takes me quite a bit of time to decide how I'm going to set it. What, what are the surrounding piece borders and sashings going to be? Mm -hmm. So I have, uh, off the top of my head, I think I can think of four or five that are sitting in my studio and I'm marinating ideas for one of them. Just recently, I think I finally have an idea coming together that I'm happy with. And okay. So I will hopefully before the end of this year, actually start working on that. I, there's just from, in my mind, so many interesting things to continue to embroider that I will, although I do other things, I don't do embroidery exclusively. I love doing all the other kinds of things. Yes. So, yeah, that's wonderful. It's nice to have um, the ability to do all the techniques mm -hmm. so that when you have a piece of red work and you want to uh, sash it right. or you want to you know, put it into a quilt, you have all the techniques in your repertoire to pull right. from. So you could add an applique border. You could add piece to sashing. There's so many different ways that you can embellish and add to the red work. So I can't wait to see where your journey brings you. And I have to tell you, the design I'm thinking of, I'm pretty sure I'm going to use your leaf galore ruler because there's this particular shape I want to put in it. And I thought I could do that with that ruler. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So you have the rulers yourself. Yes, yes. Okay. Have you used them for any projects yet? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, that's, that's, they're always in the back of my mind. I can use these. I, I know I can use these. <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll have to discuss that design idea that you have. I would love to see what you're thinking. Okay. <laughs> I might just have some ideas on how to execute your plan. <laughs> well, um, I, Sandy, I want to, I want to uh, circle back around to your guild involvement. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I always ask my guests is, do you belong to a guild? Well, I know the answer to that question. Yes. Do you belong to more than one guild or no? No, I just, just belong just by to the one state. right now. Yes. Okay, yes. good. And you are the president of that guild. Yes, I'm starting my second term as president. So tell me what being the president of a guild involves, first of all, and then we'll circle back to another guild question after that. Um, the bylaws in our guild are pretty um, clear as to what the president can do. And it's surprising that even though it sounds so limited, it still keeps me pretty busy. Um, I can only, I can convene and chair meetings. I can write checks in the absence of the treasurer. I can sign contracts. I can appoint people to committees. That's 
like really what I do. I, I work with the members of our board, the other officers, to do everything else. So um, I work with the programming committee to help decide on who our speakers are going to be. Um, I set up the agenda for our uh, business meetings that we have. Um, I help. I worked very hard organizing the quilt show. I, I've done. I've done a little bit of everything. There isn't a single committee that we have that I don't think I haven't had it. Handed. Okay. How long have you been a member of your guild? I joined, I believe, in September of 2019. Oh, so it's a fairly fairly recent for you. Correct. Uh, yes. Okay. Excellent. So I love that you're so involved in your guild and um, that you belong to a guild in the first place. Many people don't get involved in a guild because they're worried about that responsibility of taking on a chairman's role or a board position or a committee role. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit and what the guild brings to you that makes the effort worth putting that time into your guild and even holding a board position as important as the president. I, right now, I worry that in, since we're in the post COVID world, people have discovered online tutorials and they don't see the value of a guild meeting. Now, I understand, yes, you can do an online tutorial and you can learn a lot. But I think when you have a presentation face to face and you can actually see the quilts up close, um, you get more out of it. I, I really yeah. do. And yeah. um, also you have the opportunity to speak to the teacher directly. And you can sit, even just talking with the person you're sitting next to, because uh, um, you can learn a lot from that. I can't tell you how much you can learn from being in a room with a lot of other quilters, because you can bring your questions and share your ideas. And in our guild, we have a lot of small sewing groups where people, mm -hmm. say groups of four or five or six people get together once or twice a month and do sewing together. Um, we also have the guild sponsors a um, meeting like that once a month where people can bring anything they're working on and we just get together and so and that's an opportunity that you have to learn from others oh how did you do that i always wanted to know how to do that we went i attended one time and someone brought a project they were working on and they said this one block just doesn't work for me and we all looked at it and said it's beautiful it's fine you're you're you know worrying about nothing so I think that's something that um, the uh, guild really brings to your quilting experience. Yeah, it's um, that encouragement, yes. that that actual contact with real people. As much yes. as I love being online with all of my ladies here, and we have so much fun I'm and sure. such a wonderful experience learning, I can't give them a big hug. Right. I, I can't reach out yes. and have that personal contact. And I think that that's truly important in the post-COVID world to mm -hmm. get back to that face-to-face -face contact. And right. uh, it's always amazing to me, even when I've been with my ladies for two, three, four years, when we meet face-to-face, -face, it's a totally different mm -hmm. experience. Now, um, another thing is uh, if your guild is well organized, and I don't think ours is as good as it could be, um, your committee should be not one person carrying the load. It should be two or three people working together. And yes. that way you get to share ideas and one person isn't stuck with the entire burden. And that makes doing it a fun activity with your friends in the guild. Many hands make light work. But yeah. the other thing that, um, someone said to me when they were um, recruiting me to be president. And that was that I would really become friends with people in the guild if I had a position in the board. And it's true, when I first joined the guild and I didn't really know one in the room, I would come and take my seat and you know watch the presentation and do a little chit chat with the person sitting next to me. But I never really had an opportunity to become friends with those people. After serving as an officer, I mean, these women in the guild, they are my friends. We yes. become very close. We're very supportive of each other. And it, it's just been wonderful. And, you know, as, as we age, as everybody ages, your circle of friends starts to shrink, especially, you know, when you retire and you start 
stop working and not seeing so many people every day. It's mm -hmm. a great way to have a reason to get out of the house. You have friends to go fabric shopping with you, but you're being engaged with other people in your community. And that's really good for your mental health too. Yeah, it's good for every part of your health, your mental health, even your physical health. Yes. I think getting out and being with people is so, so important. So important. So important. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad, Sandy, that you have taken on such a leadership role in yeah. your guild. Thank that you. guild is near and dear to my <laughs> heart. And I'll let you know, I'm still a part of one of your mini groups. Oh, I, I go to see the Pink Flamingos. Um, I used to go once a month uh, when my mom was living close by. Mm -hmm. Now I do two or three times a year. And it's just such a lovely group of people. They are my mom's friends for the mm -hmm. past 40 years. Wow. Yes. And it's just, um, it's, it's, as you said, these people become your true friends. Mm -hmm. Those people that are there for you, no matter what happens in your life, these are true friends that can, uh, that will call you on the phone, that will bring by a casserole, mm -hmm. that will be there when you are um, uh, going through the happiest moments of your life and also the saddest and uh, most uh, challenging moments of your life. Absolutely. So, yeah, true friends in the guild. I have to say, I've, I've been in my guild for 30 years. Wow. And yes, I can absolutely say that some of my guild members are my closest friends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Sandy, it has been so much fun diving in your world of quilting just a little bit. Um, could you type or, or could you give me your contact info? So if somebody wanted to reach out to you, where would they find you? Um, you can email me directly. My email address is scmitra, M-I-T-R-A, quilts at gmail.com. scmitraquilts at gmail.com. scmitraquilts at gmail.com. I just put that in the chat so you can copy that down. So it's S-C. C is in cat. C. Yes. M-I-T-R-A. Good. And my... My Instagram okay. is scmitra153. Okay, so it's at scmitra153? Yes. Okay, on Instagram. Excellent. I put that in the chat as well. So people, you can follow Sandy and see her latest creations in her red work quilts, in her uh, more contemporary quilts, in all of the different uh, ways that Sandy gets to express herself through her beautiful quilts. Sandy, it has been such a pleasure to be here with you today. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I really enjoy uh, visiting with you and I love your quilts. I love your oh, work. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. So everyone, just to give you a little bit of information about what's happening this week at Sue Pellin Designs, uh, we are having to, uh, this evening, I am doing a presentation for the Marathon Quilt Guild in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Everyone is welcome. We meet at the Faith uh, Community Church that is on, I believe that's, oh gosh, it's Hopkington Road. I don't know. It's the one that goes into Ashland. It's the straight shot and it's very close to Weston Nurseries in Hopkington. So if you'd like to attend the meeting tonight, feel free to come. I'm inviting everyone and I was given permission to do that. Now my little guild, the Hopkington Guild, I belong to two, the Hopkington Guild officially has about 28 members. So it's a very small little guild and we love to join forces with other guilds, bring people together for a program like mine this evening. Then on Wednesday and Thursday this week, I have demo days. I used to travel around to shows all over the country and I'm not doing that anymore. In fact, Sandra is going to one of my favorite shows <laughs> in Santa Clara, California. Normally for years, I was there every year. So now, how do I get the word out about Rotary Cut Applique? I do demo days and I do applique school 
here online. So Wednesday and Thursday from 4 to 5.30, we'll be doing demo days where I can demonstrate how to use the Leaves Galore and the Hearts and More tools, but we'll be going a little bit further and we'll be talking about all of my favorite tools that I use to make my applique quilts. Now, we do have a new pattern that's currently available, and it is the Old Glory pattern. This is the one block quilt. We also have a four block quilt in that pattern. And uh, to, uh, Wednesday night, when I do my presentation tomorrow night, I'm going to show you an easy way to cut these waves using the Grand Leaves Galore tool. So if you haven't signed up for demo days yet, you can go to suepellindesigns.com and right up at the top, you're gonna find a banner that lets you sign up for demo days. Then you'll get the Zoom invitation and you can come to one or both demo days happening on Wednesday and Thursday. That's tomorrow and the next day at four o'clock Eastern time. Well, Sandy, this has been such a pleasure having you on Sewing in Slippers with Sue. I hope you'll come back and I hope you'll invite all of your friends and everybody out there watching. Invite all of your friends to watch Sewing in Slippers with Sue. We're here every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And if you don't catch us live, you can watch the replay at Sue Pellet, excuse me, on the Rotary Cut applique Facebook page. That is Fusible Rotary Cut Applique. Just search Rotary Cut Applique and you will find our Facebook page. You can also find us weekly on YouTube. So invite your friends to watch our uh, very fun, very casual sewing in slippers with Sue. Sandy, it's been such a pleasure. I can't Thank wait you what you come up with next. Congratulations on your Sea Life quilt. It is quite exquisite. And I was so pleased to be able to award my ribbon to your beautiful quilt. Enjoy the Santa Clara show. I will. <laughs> Bye, Sandy. Thank you Bye. so much.